the chart up here from last week. We're going beyond it, and uh, hopefully you grasped what we were trying to teach last week. Uh, I'm not going to review it, but there's a, a word that we used, learned last week that's going to be important for our study this week. So take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2. An extremely important event. event. Eventually, later on in the book of Acts, I'll, I'll actually warn you about false teaching, uh, and I'm not talking about the tongues thing, because we'll get into that real soon here, but uh, uh, the, the, the wrong understanding of the whole chapter of Acts 2, what, what some people think is taking place, but before I would try to warn you about what people teach about Acts chapter 2 that's wrong, all we need to do is study and find exactly what is happening here, and if someone else says something else is happening, we'll know from Scripture that that's wrong. The way that you expose a lie or false doctrine is you know the truth. And the truth does indeed make you free. And, uh, and so we're going to study it just to understand exactly what is happening here because it is a major event. It is an important event in history. Uh, it is the next major event after the first coming of Jesus Christ. His entrance into the world and, and his three-year ministry with, in the nation of Israel. He's now gone in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is going to come into the world. And we just began last week in verse chapter 2 and verse 1. Let me read the first four verses for you. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now last week I told you I wanted to spend some time talking about Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was fully come, so that's pretty much what we talked about last week. Down in verse 4, when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the fulfilled prophecy of Acts chapter 1 verse 5 that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So even though we've studied that quite extensively, we need to really understand exactly what that means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in relation to the context of Acts chapter 2. And then, then they spoke in tongues, and that's a big issue today that uh, certainly this is the beginning of it actually happening, one place it's mentioned before this as something that would happen, but now that it's broken out for us to study what it is and why it happened. Uh, we'll be right in the context and we'll actually settle the issues that later come up in the Bible just by knowing what this is and, and why it's happening, why they're speaking in tongues. Now last time when we talk about the day of Pentecost, that phrase in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost uh, was fully come, that that expression of fully, there's two things that, that you need to realize in that. When something is fully come, then that is a one-time event. It's a non-repeatable event. Pentecost, like it came here, is never going to come again. The day of Pentecost will show up later. But when it says it fully came, the fulfillment of what the type of Pentecost was came to its fulfillment, came to its conclusion. Uh, and, and we demonstrated that last week by going back in Israel's feast days and showed how their feast days, now there's holy days and feast days that followed each one, that each one of them are the things in the Old Testament that Israel did is a, is a type and a shadow of a fulfillment of reality. And that's the importance of Jesus Christ. When he died, he died on Passover. And Passover was a picture of God passing over Israel in judgment. And, and Jesus Christ and, and the blood, the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ shed his blood so that there could be a Passover, a passing over of judgment uh, for the nation of Israel. And that's, that's kind of an easy picture to see. But then we move on to the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost, when it fully came, Pentecost is also related to the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits. And, and what's happening on the day of Pentecost is the nation of Israel, there's a birth date taking place within the nation of Israel, and the first fruits of what God's purpose for the nation of Israel is, is coming to fulfillment. And, and that's why Pentecost is a one-time event. It's a feast of first fruits, but it's coming. The day of Pentecost was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. God's not going to constantly pour out the Holy Spirit. Every time someone gets saved, he don't pour out the Holy Spirit. 
He poured out the Holy Spirit on the believing remnant of Israel. Now other people will come into that blessing. But these are the first fruits of what God has for the nation of Israel. And just kind of finishing our typology, we started realizing after there's these these four events that take place uh, for the nation of Israel, the, the Passover and Unleavened Bread, Pentecost and Feast of First Fruits, that later in the seventh month they started out with a blowing of trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which is when God saves Israel. And, you know, we always relate salvation from our sins on the cross. But we're also warned in the book of Romans that after the age of grace is over, <coughs> their parentheses represents the age of grace, but after the age of grace is over, then it says all Israel shall be saved. The, the salvation of Israel as a nation comes at the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that's where he's going to put away their sins forever, and they'll never sin again, and they'll be at one, at one month, with God forever. And as he returns for that, on that day of atonement for them, it's the Feast of Tabernacles, dwelling in tents, or Feast of Ingathering. He's going to gather them back to the land. So just going through all that, and by the way, I put the tabernacle up here because I kept seeing the analogy of the, the brazen altar being a place of Christ's sacrifice for sin. Israel had to be water baptized before they can come into the presence of God. But in that holy place, that table of showbread, it was on the day of first fruits that they would replace the bread on that table with the new grain offering that just came in showing the, the, the typology that the 12 loaves of bread represents the nation of Israel, that God's purpose for them is to bring life to the world, that through them salvation would be brought to the Gentiles. And when I say Pentecost was the feast of first fruits, that's the beginning of what God was going to do with Israel. And so we, we drew that up there as well. Now, with, with just that in mind, that the reason that's important is, if anything, you should understand that this event that we're studying in the book of Acts has to do with the nation of Israel and God's fulfillment for His purpose for the nation of Israel. Just the fact that it's all representative or, or referring to the day of Pentecost being fully come uh, should tell you that. But the rest of the things that we'll study will also tell you that. Uh, when, when it fully came, it says in verse 2, and, and this is not really important, but last time I taught, I, I taught the book of Acts here two other times. It might have been all the way back to the first time I taught the book of Acts. Someone brought something up during class where, you know, you end up teaching the teacher. And I, I think they're right, although I don't know that I can fully prove it or not, but it's, I want to make sure that you think about this. It says again in chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. Now, a lot of times when people read the word they there and then read this whole chapter, they think that they is a reference to uh, the 120 back in verse 5 and 6 there that have been gathered back there. And uh, someone suggested that maybe that's not a whole 120 people there in an upper room, that they in that passage might be a reference to the 12 apostles. And one of the reasons for that is there seems to be a break. For instance, we pointed out that uh, when, this, when they all met in this upper room, uh, that there's different days that are passing. They're there for seven days. It's not like they went up there and never left. And, uh, and, and so why they were up there, there's these the people are gathered. In verse 15, there's an event that takes place where they're going to replace Matthias. I replace Judas with Matthias. And, uh, and so that event takes place. And then when you get to chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so there's a gap of time again between the events that took place in chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. And you don't know for sure that all 120 are up there. And, and so you, you look at that and you wonder, okay, is all 120 up there? Or is the they a reference to, for instance, when you, you got the 120 in verses 15 and 16, but if you look over in verse 23, as they were talking about replacing Judas with Matthias, it says, and they, and by the way, I have a, a friend who says, it's easy, whenever the Bible says they, you just go back and find the last pronoun. Well, you'd have to go a long way back here <laughs> to find out who the they is, because in verse 15 and 16, you got this 120, right? But then... Uh, uh, Peter stands up among that group and he starts making some statements and in verse 23 it says, And they appointed two, Joseph and Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and, and Matthias. 
well, put the end in the wrong place there, but they appointed two, they, Barsabas and, and Matthias. Who appointed the two? Did all 120 decide who's going to replace Judas? Or are the 12 the leaders here? Now, it doesn't say, I mean, you read that, I don't know how you determine that. Maybe someone knows English better than me. But uh, it, verse 24, they prayed and they said, Lord, thou knowest the hearts of all men. Show whether these the two thou hast chosen. And he made, uh, and uh, he that hath taken part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his place. Verse 26, and they gave forth their lots. Now, who's that? <laughs> did all 120 give forth a lot, or did only the 12 give forth a lot? Uh, my mind, I always thought it was just the 12, but if that's the case, when you get to chapter 2, verse 1, and, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Are we talking about the whole 120, or are we just dealing with the 12 here? And, as, and the reason I say that, as you continue down uh, through chapter 2, you get down to verse 7, and it says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now, that's, that can't be a reference to all 120. So, all that speak, that takes us back to verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Is it only the twelve apostles there? <laughs> Lou's got to be... You got a verse or you just... Well, the, 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 the verse prior to it. The multitude came together and they all did it. All. What verse are you reading? Uh, verse 6. Oh no! Verse six is the lost people gathering. <laughs> it's not. It's, no, 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 no. No, no. Here, my point is, in ver, the people who are speaking, they begin to speak in verse four, and in verse seven, the comment is, "Are not all these that speak Galileans?" Implying to me, it's the twelve apostles. I just throw it out to you to, to consider that that the, that the twelve there might be a reference to the twelve apostles because. When, he, when Peter starts explaining some things, he says in verse 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said. Yeah. And so, uh, th- all you need to realize is there is some time break between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And there is no doubt that, that by the time, like the leadership is taken control of the meeting in chapter 1, And certainly the people who are speaking in chapter 2 seem to be the 12 apostles. There is no doubt, by the way, that when you get down to verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, if that is a reference to only the 12 apostles, it is also a fact, a true fact, that all 120 of the believing remnant were filled with the Holy Spirit, in the sense that that is God's promise to the nation of Israel, not just His promise to the 12 apostles. Uh, but anyhow, someone brought up to me the fact that, uh, that in the context that everyone reads chapter 2 in light of chapter 1 as if it's just all happening like that, and it's not. It's over a seven-day period of time with some breaks in time, and, and it could be that this, the upper room and the apostles are the ones that, well, at least that the, the chapter is focusing on, that they are the ones that are doing the speaking of tongues and, and standing up and, and testifying about what these things are about. Now, I don't think we're going to settle that here or anything, and it might not make any difference anyhow. What's most important is for us to, to go down and understand what is this event. Back in verse 2 of chapter 2, they're there, they're all, in, uh, they're all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Interesting that we know what's happening here, the Holy Spirit's coming. And, and there's going to be some things that, details that are going to explain his appearance, his, his coming. The Holy Spirit, you can't see him. So he comes in, there's a sound, and it's not just, you know, a little breeze coming through, a mighty rushing wind. And it, and it fills his house. You know, you just picture the curtains blowing and everything, and, and all of a sudden somebody realized something blew in, you know. Uh, then in verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So, how you have a cloven tongue, unless that's a, a tongue, <laughs> or a fire that looked like a tongue, that, uh, that, that had a split in it, you know. Uh, sometimes I look at cloven and actually think, and it sat upon each of them, you know, the opposite of cleave, or not the opposite, 
the past tense is clove, <laughs> cloven. But but it, I guess cloven tongues is that is that uh, uh, divided tongue. And you, you've seen the pictures where people draw the picture. They show this fire with two flames and. Uh, whether that looked like a tongue, I don't know how you call it cloven tongues, but the point is, is that there's a visible appearance here that's identifying, and when I, when I think that it sat upon each of them, I'm thinking it's upon the 12 apostles. Uh, that's why that's a little bit significant there. But what's happening is the Holy Spirit's coming, In verse 4 it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, the identifying fact that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We'll study tongues later. I want you to understand exactly what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And why does it say they were all filled with the Holy Ghost? Again, turn back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. The Lord told them to stay in Jerusalem until this event took place. So this event finally came, this anticipated event they've been waiting for, and, and it was described to them before it came by the Lord Jesus, before he ascended back into heaven, saying in verse 5 of Acts 1, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So you can actually put an equation here. To be baptized with the Holy Ghost is to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because they're waiting to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, and when the Holy Ghost came, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And th- this came to them, as it says in chapter 1, verse 4, this was the promise that they heard of Christ, the promise of the Father. This is an event that's been prophesied since the days of John the Baptist, and really long before John the Baptist. It's a major event that prof- prophecy said would happen, and they be, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and as a result of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and it's important to understand what is taking place here. Come over with me to John chapter 3. Now you'll see the similarity just in reading this and some other things that are are said about the Holy Spirit and the things that God has for the nation of Israel. In John chapter 3, this is a popular passage of scripture where sometimes when we try to, not we, but other people try to get people saved, they're always trying to get them to be born again which then takes an interpretation of that phrase, but watch what, how that, what that phrase means biblically. John 3 and verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, it's important that you understand who Nicodemus is. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. So he, he's authority and a religious man there. The same came to Jesus by night, and that's because the religious crowd has rejected Christ, and he's trying to check it out himself, but without being branded as a Christian. So he comes to Christ at night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou do except God be with him. So he hadn't quite acknowledged Jesus Christ as the Son of God, but he's, he's realizing that Jesus Christ is of God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot, in it, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus don't even ask him a question. The Lord actually just confronts him with a, with a need. And that is, a man has to be born again to, to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, our purpose is not to study John 3, but people get into this water deal and what's the water. To me, the context is so clear that I I just can't see but what's exactly here. Nicodemus is questioned. He's questioning born again. He understands how to be born the first time. That's why he says, can a man go back in his mother's womb and be born again? When the Lord says that a man, except a man be born again, he, uh, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Water to me is the first birth. 
which all women understand that's what takes place when a child is born, a breaking of water. And then a spiritual birth has to take place. And, and I don't think Nicodemus has any problem with what the born of water means, but to be born of the Spirit, he don't quite understand that. And unless he's born of the Spirit, he can't see the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom of God is, in, in their uh, promises, is Jesus Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom on this earth. That is going to be the kingdom of God. God's reign, heaven's reign upon the earth. And, and a man, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, he cannot enter into that kingdom unless, there, unless he's born of the Spirit of God. Verse 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's water. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Yes. See, it's the second birth that's the issue. And, and so Nicodemus understands the first birth, but now the Lord is telling him clearly that he has to be born again, and, and that that born is to be born, which is born of the Spirit, is spirit, that there's a spiritual birth. Also, the thing to notice in that, when he says in verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. I'm talking to you, Nicodemus, but ye, ye is a plural term. He didn't say, you must be born again. Now, he is talking, Nicodemus must be born again. A man must be born again. So, individual people must be born again. But he's talking to Nicodemus, and he say, I, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. That's a plural term. And we just got to introduce the fact that he is a ruler of the Jews. The nation of Israel, not just a man having a physical birth and then a spiritual birth, but the whole nation has to be born again. Where did the nation of Israel come from? Abraham. And Abraham couldn't have any children until God made it possible for him to have a children. And, and there was a physical birth of the nation through Abraham. And these men think because they're of Abraham that they're going to enter into the kingdom. And he says, no, ye must be born again. The whole nation has to experience a second birth. The part of the nation of Israel that's going to enter into that kingdom is the nation that experiences a second birth. Now, so notice verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. He relates that the, uh, the birth of the Spirit is like wind that's going to come, where it decides to go. And it's not a visible thing, it's a spiritual thing. And, and so there, he, I, I look at that verse and I, th I immediately think of Pentecost and how the Spirit came as a mighty rushing wind. Verse 9 says, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? The day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the new birth of, uh, for the nation of Israel, is something that every Jewish person studying their Bible should have looked forward to and, and anticipated that event. Christ is rebuking him to be a master in Israel and not understand what he's talking about. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we know, and testify that we have seen, and, and ye receive not our witness. If I, told you earthly thi if, I, if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to the Father, and so forth. The, so the Lord is telling him that he's telling him some spiritual things, some heavenly things, and Nicodemus needs to know what it means to be born again. And to be born again is related to the coming of the Holy Spirit and a birth that's going to take place, not just for the individual, but a birth of a nation. Now, go back to me, with me to Isaiah 66. I know we've looked at this already, probably three times. By the way, one of the things that I, I always try to get people to understand you realize Nicodemus wasn't born again there. Now, even if he believed the message of Christ, my point is, is the Holy Spirit wasn't yet given. The Holy Spirit wasn't poured out till after Jesus Christ ascended back into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit is poured out, and what took place at the, on the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, there was a birth that took place of the nation. And that birth of that nation is the first fruits of the nation of Israel. For, when we say first fruits, I thought of that last week. I just assume that everybody understands what first fruits is. 
And, and this we, we studied and realized the Feast of First Fruits had to do with the wheat harvest that comes in. That's why it's related to the bread. But it's the first of the ripe of the harvest that you stop and, you, and they made this bread and they, ha- they offered it to the Lord and they gave thanks because when you see the beginning of the harvest, the very first ripened fruit, that's a sh- that displays to you the proof that there's going to be a giant harvest that's going to follow. The harvest is going to be over here where he's going to bring in the fruit into the, into the garner. But, but here, the day of Pentecost was the first fruits. It, it's, as Hebrews calls it, the taste of the world to come. Isaiah 66, it says in verse 4, and, and, and you should understand how this is a reference to the earthly ministry of Christ when you read verse 4. Isaiah 66, 4, I also will choose your delusion and will bring your fears upon, and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But, but they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that which I delight, delighted not. You know, you got that phrase when the Lord's ministry, many are called, but few are chosen. See, he called. He was calling them to the gospel of the kingdom. But he chose only the believing remnant that are going to be his people. So he called, and they didn't answer. Verse 5 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Now here's the believing remnant. Here's the ones that got frayed because there's wrath coming before that kingdom. Your brethren that hated you cast you out for my name's sake. Uh, uh, said, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. So they're rejected, and he, the Lord warned them that they rejected him, and they're going to reject the believing remnant. And here, it's, it's everything going to get cold. They're going to have to flee for their life. But when the Lord returns, he's going to return to their joy and to the other shame. So you got that tribulation in mind there. Verse 6 says, A voice of the noise of the city, a voice of the temple, a voice of the Lord that uh, rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth, and not cause to bring forth? Saith the Lord, shall I cause to bring forth, but shut the womb, saith God. Rejoice, and to warns others to war, rejoice with Jerusalem. You have two things there. You have in verse 7, as, as they're going to face this persecution, before she travailed, she brought forth. And all this is speaking about a birth of a child, right? The nation is going to have an, a birth. There's going to be a birth before she goes in travail. The tribulation is like a woman in travail with child, and it says the enemies are not going to escape during that time. But before Israel goes through any travailing, there's a birth that takes place. Then verse, seven, or verse 8 says, Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? There's that Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. Then it says, For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now wait a minute. Before she travails, she brings forth children. And as soon as she travails, she brings forth children. That's two different births that take place, isn't it? You know, when I read, in my mind, when I read, shall a nation be born in a day? To me, you realize that everything in this tribulation time centers around the middle point when the Antichrist is going to set up the image of the beast and order him to be worshipped. Until that time, he's going to look like a Christ, is he not? But any Jewish person reading their Bible, if they have any doubt who he might be when he sets up that image, they know he's not the Christ. That's when they're going to realize, "Uh uh-oh, the Christ warned us that if you reject me, someone else will come and you'll receive him. That, that, to me, that's going to be the signaling when they have to receive that mark and they realize what all that's about. There's going to be a birth of a nation all at once. But before there's the birth of a nation that takes place in that travail, even at the beginning of the travail, there's a birth that takes place before the travail. 
of first fruits, right? That's why I wanted you to see all that. What's happening on the day of Pentecost is the birth of the nation of Israel. Only it's not the whole nation and it's not the whole harvest. It's the first, it's the believing remnant at that time. There'll be a believing remnant at this time that'll finally bring, that'll be brought to all her blessings. But what's taking place there is the birth of the nation, the first fruits of that nation. Now, get two passages of scripture. Get Jeremiah chapter 31. And I want you to get the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Because there was time I didn't see this connection. And when I saw it, I always wish someone would have pointed this out to me a long time ago because it makes things a lot clearer. Jeremiah chapter 31. And Hebrews chapter 10. Now this birth that we're talking about, the birth of the nation, this is actually the, what's being fulfilled is the new covenant to the nation of Israel. And what, what Jeremiah, Jeremiah comes as a prophet in a time just as, and by this time Israel has already been taken into captivity. God's judging them. And he's judging them because they couldn't keep his law. But if Israel don't keep his law, they'll never be blessed and never be the example that God would have for the nations and would never become the minister to the nations. So God institutes a new covenant for the nation of Israel that he's going to, that's going to bring Israel to her blessings. And so that's what Jeremiah, not only does he condemn Israel, he gives them hope by telling them about a new testament, a new covenant that God has for the nation Israel. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, here it is. It says, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand uh, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now when it says, after those days he's going to write his laws in their inward parts, the days that Jeremiah is prophesying about is the days of his judgment upon Israel. And after that, he's going to put his laws in their inward parts. That's going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's where he'll forgive their sins forever. That's when the, you, no one, if all Israel will be saved at this point, then no, you won't ever have to teach another, a Jew anything. They're all going to know the Lord. They're all going to be forgiven once and for all, never to go through any testing or anything anymore. And they're going to, be, they're going to know the Lord. Now, that, that phrase, those phrase about write it on their inward parts, write it in their hearts, that, that is a, an expression that's referring to the Holy Spirit coming. That's going to take God's laws that were written in stone, and the Holy Spirit is going to write it on their hearts, impress on their hearts to do the things that he wants them to do. When it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what's happening here. The Holy Spirit is writing right in their hearts everything they should say and do, and they're under the control, complete control of the Holy Spirit there. And, and the reason I know that is Hebrews chapter 10. See, I, I didn't take, I didn't, for a long time, and I mean a long time ago though, uh, I didn't understand writing the laws on the inward parts and writing on the hearts as a, an, an expression that means he's going to put his spirit in them. Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about how the cross and how Jesus Christ through the cross sanctified them once and for all. But he says, uh, I'm going to start in verse 14, Hebrews 10, 14. It says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, by the way, when he, when he died 
on the cross, we're talking about Matthew 27, when Jesus Christ in that, that uh, uh, last supper that he had, and he took the bread and he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, that, that he's referencing the, the New Testament there as that his blood is going to be shed for the very reason or the means by which God could give Israel that new covenant. He had to die first. And so in verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now notice verse 15. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. It's a wit- the Holy Spirit came as a witness that they have been sanctified. They have been set apart as holy to God. Israel has become a holy nation to God. How do we know that? Well, the Holy Spirit is also a witness to us. After that, he saith before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Well, that's a reference to uh, Jeremiah 31, is it not? So, the Holy Spirit is a witness that they have been perfected because of Jeremiah saying that he's going to write it in their hearts. What took place here on the day of Pentecost is he's writing it in their hearts, in their minds, is he not? As a witness that Israel is, is uh, going to be the covenant people that God called them to be. That he's going to bring them into their, their place of blessing. Only this is the first fruits of what will finally be accomplished at the second coming of Christ. And see, the reason I'm, I'm saying all that, it's important not only to understand, okay, day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast day. But what does it mean they were filled with the Holy Spirit? God began to do in the nation of Israel what he's going to ultimately establish the nation of Israel on the earth to be. A holy nation, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. They're going to be his people that are going to teach the Gentiles the ways of God. And, and that, the first fruits of that came on the day of Pentecost. Now this is important, so you've got to get this yet. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now this is also, Ezekiel writes at a time when Israel was going, uh, was already uh, been seized a second time. There's some captives taken away, it wasn't the last time, but uh, the, the end is near for the whole nation. Ezekiel's already taken into captivity, and, and he's prophesying not only of the judgment, but God's promises to the nation of Israel that he's still going to use them for the purpose that he created that nation of Israel for. Uh, um, first. Chapter 36, verse 10 says, I will multiply men upon you, and all, your ho- all the houses of Israel, even all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste build, builded. So he, there is a restoration for the nation of Israel. Verse 23, it says, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. See, Israel is supposed to be a testimony to the nation. But since God had to judge them, were they a testimony? Or did God's name get profaned among the heathen? Yeah, because Israel didn't, weren't, weren't the people God wanted them to be, and they actually brought in idolatry and, and mixed that with the testimony of, of Jehovah God, and, and so they profaned the name of God among the heathen. But he says, I will, be, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now what does it mean to be sanctified in Israel before someone's eyes? Well, we already saw how that's the new covenant, the, na- the Holy Spirit being put in the nation of Israel. Verse 24, I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, bring you to your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, which I have cleansed you. And that's certainly the ministry of John the Baptist. A new heart also. John says, I baptize you with water, but he that's coming after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And here's it's explained. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. Now notice that next phrase. And cause you 
to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I give unto your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now that's, God, even though Israel had profaned God's name among the heathen, he says, as surely as I live, I'm going to be sanctified in the, he, in the eyes of the heathen in you. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways and keep my commandments and then bring you back to the land. So all that ultimately gets fulfilled here, but what's happening on the day of Pentecost, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled is actually what you read here about he causes them to walk in his ways and his keep his commandments. Time is short. I do want to show you this. Get two passages. Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 John chapter 2. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is the empowering of the nation of Israel, the filling of the nation of Israel with God's Spirit, that they're going to be completely under the control of God to be the people that God called them to be. Ultimately, He'll take away the stony heart the, heart, the heart that's been hardened toward him, and give them just that heart of flesh. But when it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, it's actually, Paul would teach you two things here, what it means to be filled, and that we're not part of the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit's not working in us like it was working in them. Because even though we have the Holy Spirit, and by the way, you know, you know what, it, Romans chapter 8 verse 23 says, it's talking about the resurrection. But it says, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul relates the Holy Spirit as the beginning of eternal life, first fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on the day of first fruits for the nation of Israel, but his perp- the way the Spirit worked in them is this way. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it's, uh, here's how he works in us. It says, in Ephesians 5, 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. Now, to be drunk with wine, we always say, is to be under the influence. You act the way you act, you talk the way you talk, you do the things that you do because you're consumed with alcohol. It's got a grip on you, it's got a hold of you, right? Turns you into another man. They even call it spirits, don't they? Fitting. That's the negative. Don't, Don't let that happen. But in contrast to that, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit of God guide your feet, guide your actions, guide your mouth. Let Him control your life. But do you know what that, yeah, you can relate it to the word when you go to Colossians. We don't have time for that now. But, but notice it says, be filled. It doesn't say, ye are filled. See, on the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't stand up and say, okay, be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came as a mighty rushing wind and they were all filled. Boom! The Holy Spirit filled them, took control of them. He's going to take control of their mouth. That's where we're going to get into tongues. He's going to take control of their action. He's going to take control of their mind. Because ultimately God's purpose for the nation of Israel is God's going to cause them to walk in His ways and keep His commandments. God's not causing you to do that today. You have to be filled. You have to allow God to work. Because God's not working in you like he was in Israel on the day of Pentecost. Because you're not the nation of Israel. And that difference, look at just 1 John. I'll just point this out and we'll close. 1 John chapter 2. The reason it's important to understand right division, we went to the book of Hebrews to understand that the book of Hebrews is talking about the new covenant to the nation of Israel. And so is 1 John talking about the new covenant to the nation of Israel when it says in verse 18... Little children, it is the last time, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Antichrist shall come, and even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, for they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that that might be manifest, they were not of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you what? Know all things. During this time of tribulation, when there's many antichrists that are going to come, the believing remnant will not be deceived by the antichrist because they're going to know. The Holy Spirit's going to work into them. Just You take out the age of grace, 
what happened on Pentecost was going to prepare them through the tribulation to ultimately be all nation, the whole nation saved, even resurrected. Look down when you get to uh, look at verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning, that if, if, the, uh, uh, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them which seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of, of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But the same anointing teaches you all things, and is true, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, if that verse was true of you today, I'd ask you, why are you here? You know, Paul writes to Timothy and tells him to preach the word. He tells him to meditate on these things, that thou might save thyself and them that hear thee. And in that passage of 1 Timothy chapter 4, he's warning them about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And the way you can be saved from seducing spirits and doctrines of devils is a man like Timothy studying God's word and teaching God's word that he'll save himself from that seduction and those that listen to him. John says something totally different, doesn't he? He said, you don't need any man teach you. The anointing you have is going to teach you because that's how God's going to work in Israel God's working in us differently in the age of grace. The day of Pentecost is all about the nation of Israel and the first fruits of what God is going to cause that nation to be at the second coming of Christ. That's why they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now we'll continue that next week. I thank you for your patience in getting that understood because everyone wants to talk about these things and have no understanding of what they're about, what they're for. And uh, certainly that's what it's about. That's what it's for. And uh, we'll see how it takes effect. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for uh, these things. And we pray that as we look at your Bible, that we might be able to connect the Old Testament promises with the New Testament fulfillments as it's in prophecy for the nation of Israel and realize how different that is. Your program for, for them as your program for us, not only in the future events, the second coming as compared to the rapture, but even how you're working today in our lives. The importance of your word, the importance of our yieldness to, yieldness to your spirit and to your word, and the importance of us to gather and study to edify one another, lest we be seduced by doctrines of devils. So, Father, I pray that this time has been beneficial that we have not only learned some things for ourselves, but also learned more about what the day of Pentecost was all about. And we'll give you thanks as we understand your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.